It is Monday, March 26th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Here with me today is former State Senator George Hooks, and we're filming at the Georgia Humanities Council in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Hooks is a sixth generation native and lifelong resident of Sumter County, Georgia. Mr. Hooks served 32 years in the Georgia General Assembly, first elected in 1980. He served five consecutive terms in the Georgia House of Representatives before becoming a state senator in 1991. Representing the 14th District in Southwest Georgia, Hooks served several years as chairman of the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee. And notably, he also held the rank of Dean of the Georgia State Senate when he announced his retirement in 2012. He currently serves as a government affairs consultant with RTA Strategy, the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah, the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, and of course, the Georgia Humanities Council. And, and I would like to thank Laura McCarty, their wonderful president, for, for giving us this, this great space to film in today um, and hosting us. Thank you very much, Senator Hooks. Thank you. Good really, to be with you. Really do appreciate your time today. I was wondering if you could, we could begin by, by telling us briefly about your childhood and your upbringing down in South Georgia. Well, it's uh, not unusual for most people to live generation in and generation out in the same community. I live on the same street that both my grandmothers were born on and I live about two blocks from the little hospital that I was born in, uh, one way, and then the other way I live two blocks from where my ancestors are buried back to the 1850s wow. and where I'll be buried. Wow. So uh, my family and I are members of the same local congregation for uh, six generations. And, and my, I went to school, grew up, and went to a public school uh, grades 1 through 12, kindergarten, and uh, was private in those days, but uh, sure. 12, uh, 12 grades. And uh, it was a lot unusual. We were well, well, many students in my class whose parents went to school with my parents. And some of me went to school with my grandparents, uh, their grandparents. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a way of life down there. It has not changed uh, that much. And and it benefited me tremendously during my political career to know who was related to who and <laughs> who liked who and who didn't like who and that type of thing. So at the time of my re uh, retirement, I represented the largest uh, amount of towns or cities, if you want to call them that, in the United States of America, 33 towns and, and as many as 18 counties. Oh, and wow. they're all small and all rural. and. Uh, it's in what you might describe in Georgia as the old black belt that sure. runs from sure. Augusta to uh, uh, below Columbus and Columbus and below to you fall Alabama. So uh, uh, it's the old cotton belt and black belt uh, area, but uh, it's a not uh, unusual childhood. I held political office, if you want to call it that, class officers in high school and then I went off to Auburn University and graduated, and uh, uh, the rest was history. So tell me about the Hooks family. What, what sort of what sort of business? What line of work? Well, were they in? my brother and I bought my father's uh, insurance company, and uh, uh, my father had bought it from his uncle's estate, his grandmother's actually brother who had passed away in 1942. My father was in the Navy in 1944 during the war, World War II, and he bought the interest in it and uh, took it off. In 1977, my brother was already in the business and I bought into the business and then turned around three years later after being home and, and ran for the Georgia House and luckily got elected by a pretty good vote. And uh, uh, the rest has been up. The Hookses have lived in my Senate district for like eight generations. Oh wow! And uh, in my uh, uh, in Sumter County for six. Uh, I'm the sixth. I'll put it that way. Now I have a son and a grandson who would make it eight. Seven uh, and in eight. Sumter County, but uh, that's not that unusual. We were related or indirectly or directly to a lot of different people down that way. But they've uh, uh, they typical old Southern family uh, in most ways. 
like other families, the Carters in particular were, were an old political family, you know, generation to generation. Was that the same for the Hooks, or was that, was that more of a business? <laughs> My family did family? not hold. I had a I had a, a great great uncle that served in the Georgia House for a short period of time. But my father was very active in politics, and uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, they were very close to the Russell family and and uh, politically and uh, and. But no, they didn't hold office. But the Carter family had been friends of ours for generations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know all the Carter relatives from everywhere. And of course, the Senate seat I held all those years was Jimmy Carter's uh, Senate seat that right. he first uh, got elected to in 1962. A, a, a very, uh, very historic uh, story about that, that Senate. <laughs> no question. I know all about it and all the characters in it. So uh, I, I'm sure I don't need an explanation. <laughs> That's of right. That. Thank you. So uh, tell me, you, you 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 grew up around politics. Um, what what drew you to elective office in in the 1970s, early 1980s? Well, I've always loved politics and have been involved in politics and uh, off and on all my life. And in, in 1962, when I was a young teenager just learning to drive, uh, the Marvin Griffin Campaign Committee hired a group of teenagers uh, in our area, to, uh, and I was one of them, to uh, uh, nail up signs uh, all over South Georgia. They'd give us a route, one day this, we went this way, one day we went that way, and because the reason was he was kicking off his campaign that July in Americas, mm -hmm. the second time he was running for governor, because ultimately he lost Carl Sanders. But, it was a great experience. Another good friend of mine, we had my father's hunting jeep. We took the dog box out of the hunting jeep and piled signs back up in that, and we'd take off uh, uh, round and about these little rural towns, going in and out of the courthouse, nailing up signs, and it, it was a great experience. And because of that, they let us sit on that platform. And when he kicked off his campaign, he fed I think it was 17,000 people barbecue that day, and uh, of course at that point he was very much the front runner. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I looked out over that crowd sitting on that uh, platform, and I'd never seen anything quite like it. And uh, we kind of more or less caught the bug a lot of us did, but that's one side of it. And mm -hmm. the other side is if you live in a community like America, and you're from a from there. Uh, you know, it's difficult to get elected down in there if you're not a native of your area. And uh, I was, and a lot of people pushed me. The seat became vacant. The representative that was held it was uh, decided to run for the Senate. Ultimately, he was not successful, but uh, I ran for an open seat and, and uh, uh, got elected. And I've uh, uh, been here ever since in one way or another. Now, were the, I'm a, I'm assuming, and I'm sure I, I, I could go back and check that that your your election was basically sealed when you won the Democratic nomination back, there was back no, then. Yes, there was no Republican on the ballot, and my election to the House was uh, uh, was tantamount to victory, and everybody's was right. down in there, the courthouse, and everybody else. I didn't face a Republican opponent until I won my Democratic primary in the, now that was in the House in 1980 and 1990. I ran for the Senate. My senator, who was a lifelong friend of, from up at Montezuma, a lifelong friend of my family's, uh, decided to retire. He and I were very close. He taught me how to run for the Senate. And uh, I was safe in the House. And uh, But anyway, the Senate gave me a lot broader experience. I kind of uh, enjoyed that. I moved up quicker sure. in, in the ladder over there, but I faced a Republican opponent in that election, but it was, uh, uh, I was v victorious uh, over that in 1990, and then I went all the way to two, the year 2000 before I faced another Republican opponent and uh, uh, was successful there. And then uh, faced another one in 2002, and uh, never had any other after that. So uh, well, that was it. Well, I suppose that begs the question: Why were there so few Republicans in South Georgia? 
the people in South Georgia, a lot of them had voted, started voting Republican, and this is the watermark with Goldwater on the national level. Right. You didn't see many voting uh, for gold uh, for uh, Republican on the local level. Now you do now, but you did sure. not then. And uh, really, I think it was Goldwater, and then later George Wallace running on the third party ticket that sewed it up because George Wallace carried Georgia, carried every county in my old Senate district, and Goldwater carried most of them also. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's when you see the real division, if you would, uh, between the political parties. Well, with, with, with Goldwater and Wallace, and obviously with Wallace, the issue of civil rights it, it was, was forefront as a concern. Was, was that... Is that indicative of sort of the the conservatism, the the cultural conservatism um, of South Georgia? Yes. Uh, to answer your question sure. bluntly, it was. I mean, Goldwater had voted against the Voting Rights Act and uh, another civil rights right. issue, and he was one of the few that did. And uh, I think that's one of the things, the reason he carried uh, the, the five deep south states he carried. He carried the same number of states Strom Thurmond carried because he was wiped out nationally. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, because he was a little rough around the edges, but uh, he still carried the deep south based on the civil rights uh, uh, era. Well, let's go back to your first campaign. and. and what does it take to, to put together a campaign? What was the message? What was the strategy? How did you introduce yourself to the voters? Well, I was 34 years old when I qualified and turned 35 right after I qualified. And my message was, and my theme was, a new vision for the 80s. And uh, uh, I was running against a man who had served up here several years, several terms back in the 60s. And he was on his maybe late fifties at the time, and I was thirty-four. And you know, I mean, and you know, my message was: look, I'm you know young enough that I can grow up in the job and that type thing. And because it wasn't the issues were not that different than they are today. I'm talking about economic development, health care, education, right. that type thing. But we, uh, uh, you know, we really uh, the big difference I think was that I brought a youthful vision to that campaign. So you, you, you're elected, as you said, handily. Um, you get up here and Speaker Tom Murphy's in charge. T tell me about Spe Speaker Murphy. Everybody has their, their own opinion about Speaker Murphy and his, how, how he ran the House. What were your initial impressions and then how did those change over time? Well, if they did, uh, to some degree, uh, Speaker Murphy was uh, uh, what you might call unpolished. Uh, he had a brilliant mind, but he was a product of uh, of the uh, mill villages over in Bremen and that type thing. And uh, he was a rock solid Georgia Democrat, but he uh, he was a New Deal Democrat. I'll right. put it that way. I mean, he was a solid New Deal Democrat, and uh, uh, they were. Uh, he was. He was pretty tough cookie uh, to deal with. I mean, when you first met him, you were uh, kind of. It wasn't poli No polish. I mean, <laughs> and he just uh, what you saw was what you got. And uh, so, his best advice to me and all the other freshmen that came in at the time was just stay in your seat and listen and study the rule book. And that's what we did. I mean, we didn't attempt to do anything. We didn't ask any questions. It wasn't until we had gone into the second and third term that we began to uh, get involved, if you will, in the process. But uh, Tom Murphy was an often misunderstood man because they, he was a product of the rural area over there in West Georgia. Uh, and, um, you know, those are old textile mill towns and and all, but he did a great deal of progressive legislation. I'm not sure Atlanta would have prospered quite as well as it did without Tom Murphy's leadership. And he would, uh, he gave everybody a fair shake. Uh, are you are you referring to that MARTA and uh, other MARTA sort of... and the World Congress Center? The World Congress Center was a hot issue in one of the sessions we were in, 
And I actually had a colleague uh, that served with me in the House that got elected to the state Senate that defeated an incumbent state senator uh, uh, who's deceased now uh, uh, on that issue. The state Senate had voted for the Atlanta, they called it the Atlanta World Congress Center. <laughs> and they just blistered it. But I mean, it was good for the state. I mean, it brought in economic development. Murphy kind of pushed it through. It wouldn't have passed uh, without Murphy's uh, uh, guidance and Marta also. And uh, most of the university system, I mean, Georgia State, I mean, he was very favorable to, if you will, Metro Atlanta. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it got less when you get in the suburban area, but uh, building up this capital city, he was, he was very successful. At the expense sometimes of his popularity at home, and uh, that's basically uh, the story, but he was not a polished gentleman like uh, a lot of people you see today. Well, I guess that, that's a good segue in, into back in the 80s, there were only a handful, maybe a couple dozen Republicans, mainly in the suburban areas, like, like you mentioned, maybe some in the cities. Uh, what were the what were the dividing lines um, within the Democratic caucus? Was it geographic, ideology, or race? It wasn't as much ideology as it was geographic. Mm, okay. Uh, the Republicans that were in the House and Senate in those days were mainly old line, if you will, Eisenhower Republicans. Okay. In the metro area, they were they were one or two from. Uh, uh, Savannah and Macon and 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 uh, Columbus, mm -hmm. but ma mainly they were the Buckhead type uh, business type Republicans. I'm not sure uh, all of them, almost all of them are deceased now, but I'm not sure they would exactly fit in with what you call the social uh, conservatives. They were business conservatives, right. what I call Eisenhower conservatives, which is not very different than the, than you know, business-wise than the Southern Democrat. Something we'll come back to uh, later on in, in the interview to get your thoughts on that. But, but working with, were there issues that, that the, the Democrats could work with those business oh, yes. conservatives, oh, yes. those business oh, Republicans yes. oh, that you yes. were talking oh, about? Oh, yes. Murphy was very partisan and uh, extremely partisan, but he would still give them a fair shake and bring them into the tent because so many of them represented the Atlanta uh, uh, business power structure, the, you know, old wealth, Buckhead type. The Kill people. Townsends and, Kill and Townsend, Johnny Isaacson. Mike Egan, Johnny Isaacson. They all worked very, very well with uh, Murphy. Now, they knew the limits. I'm not sure they liked him that much. Uh, he liked them, but they uh, they pulled together for that. They are... They are uh, they are a good, solid group. There's not much difference in the background except it's more geography than anything else. So during the 1980s, we were talking off camera before we started rolling about transportation and transportation politics. And, and the late 70s, early 80s, this was really the Tom Moreland era. And, and you served later on in the, in the Senate with Hugh Gillis, who, who was Mr. Jim Gillis's son, who I believe Senator Gillis was there for over 50, 50 years. years, yeah. Over 50 years. He was a member of the Georgia Senate, Georgia House, mm -hmm. when his brother was in the state Senate and his father was the DOT commissioner, the transportation commissioner. Uh, they were all members when they bombed Pearl Harbor <laughs> in 1941. Right. Now, they weren't, they, you know, obviously December of 1941, they weren't in session, but they were all members of the legislature. His grandfather, Hugh Gillis' grandfather had created the county they right, lived in, right, and uh, until he retired uh, in the uh, late 1990s, there'd never been anybody but a Gillis represent that county in either the House or the Senate, so, uh, uh, or the courthouse. Uh, right, but they right. were very good for Georgia. They, they really were. I mean, it was, it was, uh, they were wealthy and prosperous, but they were very, uh, they were very good uh, uh, public citizens. Well, tell me, tell me about transportation. In the 1980s, the state of Georgia is booming population-wise, especially Metro Atlanta. What was it like trying to find the funds and the political capital necessary to 
keep up and build up the, the infrastructure necessary for that kind of a growth? <laughs> well, speaking strictly, of, first of all, uh, transportation was a big issue in rural Georgia. Uh, at the time I came up here, there were a lot of dirt roads still in our area. And let me remind you, in 1946, uh, when Governor Eugene Talmadge was elected for the fourth term, unprecedented fourth term, one of the platforms was he would pave every, every road in Georgia that the mail truck ran up and down. And uh, when I came here in the 80s, not, I mean, we still had dirt roads that well, the mail truck ran up and down. Marvin Griffin had his rural roads Rural authority. road program. So uh, Georgia's politics, particularly in the uh, 20th century, were all tied to uh, rural transportation. And... Uh, now you get into the metro area, and it got to be, we got in this tussle up here about uh, MARTA, which still goes on today, Sure. and uh, rapid transit, and of course the, during the uh, 60s they began to build the interstate highways, and a lot of those are built uh, around the area of uh, the Talmadge's, uh, Herman Talmadge particularly, his friends, and uh, Governor Vanderbilt and so forth. But uh, Anyway, that's neither here nor there, but uh, road politics has always been very popular in a rural state like Georgia. Now you've got rapid transit in Atlanta, which it's critical to the future of metro Atlanta area, I think, that they uh, develop some type workable rapid transit program. So you, we, we were talking about roads and road politics and, and, and development. In the 1980s, that was... Correct me if I'm wrong, that was sort of the, the origins of the developmental highways, the four it lane. Was, it was, and I was a floor leader for Governor Joe Frank Harris, and he put in the, uh, one of the floor leaders, house floor leader, and he put in the uh, Governor's Road Improvement Program called GRIP, and that's where we were doing the secondary roads, and uh, I was honored enough to stick the road that was known as the Old Dixie Highway, Mm -hmm. that runs from Chicago to Miami. Is that uh, US 41? It's or? US 41 and 19. Right. And 19 goes through America, and we included that in the Developmental Highway Program of the Governor's Road Improvement Program, and it has just now been completed all, all the way. Wow. Which, which is a great asset. I mean, if you're the Chamber of Commerce director in America, and all you got is two-lane roads, uh, you've got to focus on that. So now we've got four-lane roads in most of Georgia, so either interstate or the, or the secondary roads. And, and I mean, we're, we're sitting here. How would you explain, obviously nobody likes to drive on two lanes for too long, but what is the economic development incentive of of, of, of four-lane divided highways? What, well, what, how can you sell First that? of all, if you're going to try to locate industry that is heavy industry, uh, they've got to have a four-lane highway. And uh, uh, various and sundry uh, shipping companies have got to have that four-lane access. And we have that now in most of Georgia. Uh, it's, it's very important. There are three components to that. Uh, air transportation, mm -hmm. and, and during the uh, uh, Busby administration and Vanderbilt administration and uh, Sanders administration, they increased a lot of the funds to airports, mm -hmm. secondary airports throughout the state, and that continued, has continued on for some time. And now, uh, and rail. And right. of course, uh, passenger rail has largely disappeared, but freight still runs by rail. So, and the other thing is, we had to improve our highways, particularly our economic development highways. The, the old multimodal transportation plans. Right. So, you mentioned earlier you had you you'd built up quite a bit of seniority in, in the Georgia House. Probably not as much as would have happened later on in the '90s and 2000s with right. all the turnover. Um, what was what was it like going from the House with uh, Speaker Murphy up into the the state Senate? And I guess by the time you got to the state Senate, Peter Howard. Um, it was Peter Howard's first term in the state Senate, and uh, as Lieutenant Governor. Right. And it was my first term in the uh, uh, in the Senate, and uh, basically uh, several of us went over there at that time, two or three of us, and a lot of new faces appeared, and. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I'm a great fan of Lieutenant Governor Howard. He uh, gave us all a fair shot. He was just an all-around great guy from an old, distinguished Georgia family. His great-grandfather had been being Harvey Hill, a United States Senator from Georgia and Confederate Senator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, he knew people all over the state, and he had a great uh, situation. And uh, my second year, uh, second term in the Senate, he made me uh, chairman of rules. And then uh, third term, he made me uh, chairman of appropriations, where I served for 10 years. Right, right. So... <laughs> Tell me about the 14th district. You, you mentioned geographic, geographically one of the largest um, state senate districts. Yeah, what what was uh, what were the key issues to to that district and, and and its makeup? Well, it was no different then than it is now. It's it's economic development and it's uh, uh, well, truthfully, also now today you've got health care. I've had three hospitals close in that district, uh, mm. which is a tremendous loss. Right. And we've had to make some shifts, and luckily uh, we've got some hospitals that have, that have been moving in and putting satellites in those communities, and uh, uh, and then edu getting our fair share of education. If you take a county like, say, Stewart or Webster, okay, Webster has got 2,000 people in it. Oh, wow. So you've got a school system with two, three hundred children, and yet almost the entire property tax base is uh, agricultural, and there's a limit to what you can contribute uh, uh, sure. locally on the local tax base. Stewart County in my Senate district, at the in 1860, I've got a map, original map on my office wall that was passed out by the General Assembly that shows the counties in, in descending order of population. Stewart County was the fifth largest county in the state in 1860, and by the year 2000, it was the fifth smallest county in the state. So we have, it had 15,000 people in it in, in 1860, mm -hmm. and today they have five. But yet, you know, uh, and they're not that many real strong working farms. A lot of that's in timberland, hunting land, and stuff like that. So there's a limit to what the, they can contribute back to the school system or the operation of those counties. So right. it's been, uh, each of my counties except two out of those 18 actually had a population loss from the census in 2000 to 2000 and, uh, uh, well, I, I guess I guess to the question, politically speaking, are we getting to the point where state senate districts in, in your neck of the woods in South Georgia are going to be the size of congressional districts? Well, they are now, in some of them. Uh, uh, some of them are larger than the congressional districts. I mean, it, everything's based on population. Right. If your counties like Webster has 2,000, Sly has three, Marion has five, Stewart has five. I mean, you got to rack up a lot of counties to get up to two hundred thousand people. What? Hmm. The is the 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 depopulation of Southwest Georgia and South Georgia, rural Georgia. We'll say is that just has that trend continued since the New Deal with with the sort of declining po agricultural population, the agricultural economy? <clears throat> Largely. Okay. It's declined since the uh, uh, Depression. And uh, uh, we've, uh, despite the fact we've had very aggressive, uh, uh, progressive leadership in a lot of areas. I mean, Governor Busby was from, originally from Vienna and, mm -hmm. and lived in Albany. I mean, Governor Carter that held my seat and and Griffin Bell, former Attorney right. General of the United States from America. So, I mean, we've had some poli great political leaders, and then we've had great uh, business leaders down through there. there you know, but uh, the base is, is agriculture. And it's not, different, not that terribly different than what they call the Piedmont of South Carolina and the Black Belt of Alabama, the Delta of Mississippi. And, and uh, I'll put it this way, there's a lot of economic opportunities. Right. Well, in, in the mid-1980s, there was a 
UGA professor, Charles Floyd, had a very influential article called The Two Georgias, that, that there, were, there was a, an economically uh, diverse and dynamic Georgia, mainly talking about Atlanta and, and metro Atlanta, and then sort of a stagnating, depopulating area beyond. What were the political implications of this acknowledgement that that there were two Georgias and that it was a problem? I I think he was 100% correct with that assessment. However, I was a full leader for Governor Harris, and Governor Harris would not allow us to even mention that. He said there's not but one Georgia, and because he was positive, uh, being a, making a positive statement, but uh, truthfully, there are two Georgias. And uh, uh, it's been one of the more interesting things to live through, I'll put it that way. Those of us that uh, represented the rural areas have got to be 10 times sharper than the people that represent the suburban areas. I mean, I would serve with people that don't have a courthouse in the district, that don't have, some of them don't even have a town. Mm -hmm. They I had 33 towns. I mean, I'm not accustomed to leaving one town, going through a rural area, go to the next town, the next town up here in the suburbia, you just, you know, it's altogether <laughs> different. Well, you served on uh, the One Georgia Authority Oversight, I, right. I think from the, when was that created? Because you, were, you it, were on there from the very beginning. I was. It was created by uh, Governor Barnes, mm -hmm. and it was a part of the tobacco settlement money. And it was to stimulate economic development through grants, various and sundry tiered levels of grants, into the under uh, economically challenged part of the state, so undeveloped parts of the state. So, uh, to a great deal, we did that with small industries, not any big splashy things, but locally homegrown industries. It was a good, good program. No, no Amazon no, HQ two. No, 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 that's foreign to us. <laughs> right. Well, you know, with with another round of you know, your your state senate district was eliminated in twenty eleven. Right. We're coming up two three years now from another reapportionment process. What, what does that mean for South Georgia? Well, it 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 spells trouble. To be honest with you. Uh, because uh, those counties do not grow. And when you base it all on one man, one vote and divide it up, I mean, uh, you got all this population growth in Metro and uh, some some growth in Savannah and, and Columbus and, and around, but they're mainly in suburban counties. And uh, it's just, uh, it spells continued trouble. I, I had to come up with close to 200,000 people. I had 156,000 and divided among as many as 18 counties. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just, I mean, without invading the I was in part of the city of Columbus and part of the city of Albany. Right, right. Uh, from time to time. I mean, it's just, it's not a good situation. On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, this is something that uh, uh, has always kind of amazed me and some of us from down in my part of the state, we, we, uh, we're local natives of our area. We've lived there forever, our families have. And we come up here and people get elected to the legislature who are from all over the country. And uh, it's just, it's very foreign to, to people <laughs> down our way. And uh, uh, I had a state representative not long ago tell me that he'd gotten to the house and the whole row in front of him were from, weren't even born in Georgia. So, I mean, they have no clue. I, you go out into a shopping mall, say Americas and or Plains, and they don't they don't have a clue what you're talking about. So uh, it makes it a little more difficult. Now the flip side is it's easy to get elected down there if you've got roots, uh, right? Uh, but the downside is you get up here and you try to identify and make these people understand uh, your colleagues understand the challenges that are before us. Uh, it makes it greater. It's it's more difficult. They they just can't conceive of that. Right. Well, I guess we can talk about that issue in a little bit. But one name I don't think we've mentioned yet is is Zell Miller, who of course just passed away Friday morning. Um, 
you know, such a, such a, a ubiquitous presence in Georgia politics, um, you know, going back to the 1960s. What 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 were your what was your your, your first memory of Zell Miller and, and your assessment of what he meant to Georgia and Georgia politics? Zell was an interesting individual, Governor Miller was, and uh, I really didn't get to know him while I served in the House. The House and Senate fought each other like crazy. Sure. And because uh, we in the House at that time were very loyal to uh, Speaker Murphy. And Miller was over the Senate, and they had a little more democracy over there than <laughs> we had in the House. And uh, my initial, he was a nice guy, but I didn't get to know him. But after I b got to the Senate, and he, he was elected governor at the same time I was elected to the Senate, and uh, he would hold leadership meetings with the leaders of the House and Senate. I was privileged enough to be one of those, met in his office on a weekly basis, and uh it's just amazing. He had the best interest of Georgia at heart, uh, and he was organized. He was focused. He knew exactly where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do. You know, it wasn't just the Hope Scholarship. It was a lot of other things, and uh, um, he was a very unique individual. Now, he's a total mountain man, and mountain down in our part of the state, uh, people share their thoughts openly and talk and you know, they're very open and uh, gregarious. Mountain people like Zell uh, are just closed-mouthed and uh, stay to themselves. And uh, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, I, he's, he was a true mountaineer, and he took that as a compliment. But uh, he, people have often said, well, how do you think up the Hope Scholarship? I said he thought by himself. I mean, he didn't have a committee or... PR firm, anything like that. He just told you what it way it was, and uh, uh, that's very different than than it is down my way. It's mountain people are tightened to themselves. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's just the way it is. Well, you mentioned the Hope Scholarship, and I think people of my generation take it as a given that there's going to be uh, if you get good grades and, and you want to go to school here in the state that it's going to be there and available. And if you want to buy a, a, a Powerball ticket, so you know, so be it. Take your two dollars in cash and buy it. It wasn't a it wasn't a certainty that the Hope Scholarship was going to get passed back in the early nineties. Everybody, 90s, was it? without exception, thought he was crazy. He was taking on the established Protestant denominations in Georgia. Right. And particularly the Baptist and Methodist churches just came after him with a vengeance. Uh, the uh, news, the weekly newspaper, the uh, uh, Wesleyan Christian Advocate coming out of the Methodist church said they didn't want him to ever set foot on another college campus owned by the Methodist church. And uh, uh, then the Georgia Baptist uh, uh, newsletter was was about as bad. And and you know, nobody in the legislature wanted to take on the two most powerful entities in the state, the churches, those two Protestant churches. But, uh, of course, he hammered away and hammered away and hammered away and just his old thing. I mean, they treated him, those two, the leadership of those two denominations, pretty about as rough as I've ever seen. But uh, uh, now they embrace it. Oh, so, sure. Uh, uh, it's interesting. But... He he learned from other states, Florida and Illinois, and these states that passed these lotteries. They put it in the general fund, <laughs> and he made us pass, and we did pass a constitutional amendment where it's separated from the general fund money, and goes strictly to uh, uh, scholarships. And then later he came back with the K uh, with the kindergarten program. Right. Right. And people thought he was crazy then. The superintendent of schools at the time, who's no longer with us but uh, uh, in active uh, service, she said that it was nothing but a glorified babysitting service. And uh, he was governor of Georgia because he jumped out of his chair and that type thing. And uh, uh, he knew that if you put that child in that early learning situation, that uh, their chances of improvement in graduating high school were uh, much better. 
So, I mean, he faced a tremendous amount, but he had that old North Georgia Mountaineer tenacity. But everybody told him that it was crazy. Well, you know, he he was a school teacher. He was a product of the history department at UGA and, and family of school teachers. Um, and as a resident of Illinois, I can confirm that Georgia uh, has the right idea when it comes to the lottery. But tell me about the state flag uh, and the the history of the state flag and your role in in the process of, which, and of course, Governor Miller tried um, in his first term and almost bit him in 94, but go ahead and tell me about that process, if you will. Governor Miller called a group, leadership group to Atlanta, and we met in the governor's office, and he, he said, I'm going to change the state flag back to the way it was in 56, before 56, and uh Everybody to the person in that room told him he was crazy, don't do it. Well, we didn't get, to, I didn't get South good out of Atlanta before it came on the radio that he was going to introduce that. And he did. Finally, he dragged around, dragged around during the session. He finally introduced it in the uh, Senate. And uh, Wayne Garner and Pete Robinson were his floor leaders and they carried the flag. And uh, I was chairman of the Rules Committee, and we got it in the Rules Committee, and uh, uh, we finally finagled some kind of bill out of the Rules Committee that took it to the floor, but it put an amendment, it put a <laughs> referendum on it. And Governor, uh, Attorney General Bowers ruled that a referendum was unconstitutional. Well, of course, then I got Griffin Bell to go, uh, we went over to the uh, King and Spalding building, and, and Griffin Somebody Bell. who knows a little bit about the law. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he said, no, you can do it that way. It's unusual, but you can do it that way. So anyway, we passed it with a referendum on it in the Senate, and uh, at that point he'd gotten so much heat that he asked uh, Chairman of the House Rules Committee uh, that had the bill to withdraw it, Bill Lee from down at Forest Park. And he withdrew it, and uh, frankly he on numerous occasions said that was a terrible mistake to do that during his first term and it almost got him beat. I mean, truthfully, he had a wealthy businessman mm -hmm. with no experience running against him, but it wasn't necessarily they were voting for him, they were voting against Miller. Right. So I guess I into Governor Barnes's administration it comes back up, um, the, the flag issue, and, and there's sort of the, the blue flag, which uh, a, a much decried, much criticized flag. I think the, the term that's thrown around is the Denny's placemat or Shoney's placemat or something, something of that nature. But how do we get to the point where we have the flag we have now, which is well, sort of like the pre-56? I passed that amendment, and it was my design to get up uh, with the staff of the Carl Vinson Institute in Athens. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, Governor Purdue had been elected under the promise that he would, you know, change that uh, Denny's placemat flag, <laughs> and uh, uh, they passed one in the House, but it had the terrible dimensions on it and a lot of flaws in it, and uh, then that was a choice that was going on the ballot between that flag and the other one. Well, I had already drafted an amendment to take us to the current flag that we have now, which is a facsimile of the pre-56 flag, except I think it's a lot prettier. <laughs> and uh, it's a combination, and uh, we I worked and had it drafted and actually had the amendment in my pocket all session, and uh, it had passed out of the Rules Committee, and uh, by then it was controlled by the Republicans, and uh, we did not, uh, had the votes to change that to my amendment in, in the Rules Committee, but it got to the floor, and I introduced it by myself with no other co-sponsors, amendment number one to the House bill that changed the flag. Under, this is under produced 93, his first year. Uh, 03. 2003. 2003. And uh, uh, it passed with 29 votes. <clears throat> and exact number it took, and Senator Johnson, who was majority leader, moved it would reconsider. We did reconsider. They did reconsider it. It got 30 votes on reconsideration, and finally uh, we got the, they voted again and got the 
and that that's all. After you can't vote but twice. Mm -hmm. And we voted again. It was twenty nine votes, same twenty nine. And uh, then the bill passed with the design of the current state flag. I felt like it was the right thing to do. It wasn't offensive, and it's very historic and attractive. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the th arguments against the uh, Barnes flag. Right. It compromised so much it wasn't distinctive at all. Sent it back to the House on the 40th day. And uh, they got uh, uh, 90 votes on the floor of the House. And the Speaker of the House at that time, Terry Coleman, had to, had to vote. And he cast the 91st vote. And it came back to the Senate. We agreed with the House. And so it passed the House and Senate by one vote. But I'll have to give Ed Jackson over at the university. I'll give him credit now over at the University of Georgia, Carl Vinson Institute. He's dead, retired now. Mm -hmm. But he and I worked daily to get that design just right. He did the art, artist work. I told him what to do and uh, what I wanted. And uh, uh, he won a national award for, for doing it I, on design. The vexology, the, the, yes. the study and artistry of flags. But no, Mr. Jackson's been a very good friend of the, well, of the Russell Library. And, and, and I couldn't have done it without him. I mean, I did the political maneuvering, and I told him basically early on what I wanted and the design, and he would go back and forth between Atlanta and Athens until we, uh, uh, until we got it perfected is the word. Well, I, I guess we, we, we sort of skipped ahead a little bit to, to Sonny Perdue, but who was a colleague of yours in the, the state Senate as a Democrat. Did it surprise you when, when, when Governor Perdue, then Senator Perdue, uh, switched parties? Yes, it did. And uh, I guess I it was 98. It, uh, uh, he, he had some internal conflicts with some other members of the Senate, not with me. Uh, in the Democratic caucus, and uh, he just he just decided to change. Now he's still a good friend of mine, and that didn't affect my relationship with him, personal. Sure, sure. And all, but he, uh, uh, yes, it surprised me. But I didn't know that he had some other conflicts outside of uh, the two of us. So, two thousand two rolls around, um, and, and Sonny Perdue's running for governor wins the nomination, and goes up against Roy Barnes, the incumbent, who by all measures was, was had more money to spend, had the power of the incumbency. Were you surprised when the final votes came in? I was not. I was one of the few people that was not surprised. Uh, I was out there running for re-election at the same time, so I knew what I was hearing out in the hustlings, if you would. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, it goes back to Martin's changing the flag was one of the things. The other thing was school teachers. He'd made all school teachers mad, and that's a heck of a network. I think he felt like he was doing the right thing for education. But uh, uh, and he did a lot of the right things with the wrong timing. I'll put it that way. And uh, if he'd had a little more thought in the flag and a little more thought in the education thing, a little time to smooth that around, he would have uh, probably been successful. Uh, so I was not terribly surprised. Now, all the pollsters and all the newsmakers in the state were totally shocked, but I was not. And, and you think a lot of that was because, I mean, we, we talked about earlier how South Georgia was, was sort of the yellow dog Democrat. You know, my, my, my granddad, my, my dad were, were Democrats. In 2002, you had on the, the statewide ticket Sonny Perdue from from uh, from bon Houston Air. County mm -hmm. and Bonaire, and then Saxby Chambliss from Moultrie. Well, how much did it mean that the face of the, the Georgia Republican Party were Sonny Perdue and Saxby Chambliss, as well, opposed to those Buckhead Republicans we were talking about? It meant a great about? deal. It meant a great deal, and because um, Moultrie's down there, not far up south of me, and. Uh, my Senate district abutted Sonny's uh, in uh, two counties of nine district and up against Houston. So, I mean, we're not that far apart. And uh, they, I think they will, uh, I think that had a major impact. 
But if I had to point to uh, Governor Barnes making one mistake, uh, two mistakes, it was the flag and the teachers. And then right after the election, so of course Governor Barnes is defeated, um, and then three, I believe it was three of your Senate colleagues, Democratic colleagues, switch over. Uh, Senator Hill, Jack Hill, um, Rooney Bowen, and Don, Don, Cheeks. Don Cheeks all switch over sort of And as I a group. was the second call he made after he'd been elected. I had just been elected the night before on a Tuesday. And uh, my assistant down there in America and one of my assistants in my office came running in and said, Sonny Perdue's on the phone. You got a phone call. That was like 9.30 in the morning. We'd been up all night and I, he I'll spare you the whole detail of the conversation, but he said he wanted me on his team, and I said, well, I'm on your team. I'll help you in every way. And he said, well, no, you don't understand. I, I want you on the team, and he was laying it to me. And uh, I said, Sonny, I, I, you know, that's not something I can do. I, I said, I've just been elected as a uh, Democrat, and uh, regardless of how I might feel toward you personally and help you, I just, you know, it's not anything I can do. I said, President of the United States just gave me a barbecue two weeks ago as Democrat, and uh, uh, the day he got the Nobel Peace Prize, and I said he, my picture was all over the world with him. And uh, besides that, I just you know I don't change churches, and I don't change wives, and I don't <laughs> change. Uh, it's not anything I can do. So he said, well, he got a little, little firm because he'd been up all night. And I said, well, Sonny, you need to get some rest. He said, well, I gave you the 5 o'clock to think about it, and then I want a firm answer by 5 o'clock. Uh, uh, we're going to have to meet on the campaign trail. I said, well, that may be what it'll take, you know, if that. So I uh, <laughs> kicked it around all day, and I finally called at his headquarters and, and got Eric Johnson on the phone, and Eric said, well, don't worry about it. He hadn't had any rest. And then I said, Eric, it's not anything I can do. I mean, the others did. and uh, But I, it's not anything I could, in my heart could do. I'll sure. put it that way. What was it like? You know, you'd been in the, the General Assembly, House and Senate, since 1981 in the majority governing party. What, what was that transition to the, to the opposition, the minority party, like in 2003? Well, in... in some ways it was very difficult. In other ways, in the Senate it was not. Because I had the seniority and the way the rules are established in the Senate uh, on a seniority system, uh, I was pretty much protected by, uh, by that. I mean, I had to move out. I gave up the, they took chairmanship appropriations away from me, as sure. I expected. And uh, they, uh, uh, transferred my parking space around, which really didn't mean anything. And I moved to another office on the fourth floor. It was actually uh, uh, Senator Gillis's old office, and uh, uh, which was fine. But the rest of it stayed pretty much the same because and the House would have been altogether different. But in the Senate, uh, because of the seniority system, we, uh, uh, we respected each other. And, then it finally dawned on a lot of the new Republicans in the Senate that they didn't that I held the knowledge of of how to do it and they did not know how to do it and they started coming around and they included me in the discussions and I was glad to help them for the benefit of the state. So you served a total of thirty two right. years. If you, you it's unfair of me, but I'm gonna do it. If you can point to one thing that, that you're most proud of in your time in the legislature, uh, your accomplishments? Oh, I don't think there's any question that uh, I, I've held a lot of positions uh, in rules, uh, chairman of rules, chairman of appropriations, taking home the bacon to your district and improving everything. But I think the one thing that I personally did to change the history of this state was changing that state flag. Right. I mean, <clears throat> it's hard for somebody to realize today what a mammoth issue that was and polarizing issue uh, for the state of Georgia. So I think the as, as my colleagues call it the hooks flag that we have today, I think it changed the history of Georgia. I'm not sure we could have ever moved. I mean, talk about 
Amazon and all these other people, you you know, Mata and all this stuff. I mean, it would have destroyed Georgia if we hadn't done something. But what I, my passion was to make it historically correct mm -hmm. and yet uh, not a polarizing uh, thing to bring all Georgians together. So uh, the beautiful thing is, to me, it passed by one vote in the House, one vote in the Senate, and Governor Purdue signed it on his birthday, on my birthday, and gave me the pen. And I have it framed uh, with the original amendment down in my uh, office in America. That's great. So, so let, let's zoom out a little bit and, and talk about sort of politics in Georgia and, and the parties. How would you describe the Georgia Democratic Party when you think of it as a, as, as a, as a party organization? How would you describe it during your, your, your political career? Well, we didn't think in terms of party that much. Uh, uh, you had the urban versus rural, which you've always had, mm -hmm. and uh, the Democratic Party was more or less rural conservatives and urban liberals, and uh, everybody kind of got along. Uh, but I, I, it was the party of strength and power. We didn't meet, have caucus meetings. I never will forget. Uh, we had a first caucus meeting when I was in the House. Uh, over in one of the hotels with so many people. Uh, but it's it's a different world now. They're more polarized, and I, I don't think it's for the best, either party. Why, why do you think the Georgia Democrats were able to hold on to power so long? You know, we talked about 1964, 1968, sort of that presidential level voting. <clears throat> they focused on local politics. That's the secret. You focus on local politics and local uh, issues. You don't focus on national politics. Didn't matter who was run, necessarily running for president, but whatever. <laughs> so you know, we we talk you talk about local politics. You know, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter's come up a little bit. He, all, he always described himself as a Georgia Democrat. You, you you know the what's the distinction between a Georgia Democrat and a National Democrat? Georgia Democrat focuses on issues that are important to Georgia, not on national or international issues. That is the key. Do you think that's a distinction that that you know, political observers and 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 folks in politics today would make, or that it would make sense that there are Georgia Democrats and National Democrats, or is that something a, a bygone era? I think it, to some degree it's a bygone era. Now, it's not necessarily in various parts of rural Georgia, but in uh, in the state as a whole, it's probably a bygone era, and that's a shame. It's a shame. You know, so much, so much of, uh, of Georgia politics of keeping, uh, of electing folks like like Jimmy Carter and George Busby, was the ability to, to to unite those urban progressives, African Americans, white liberals with rural South Georgia Democrats. Why is that sort of coalition? Um, why doesn't it exist anymore? Well, it can be done again with the right type of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you will see see that uh, it's kind of drifted away from that to some degree. And uh, both both uh, ends of that perspective have, have to give to some, some degree. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it, I, I mean, it, it, in my opinion, it's moving more back in that direction. Although we've been through a long period where it's separated. Well, I guess that, that, that leads me in my next question. We, we talk about 2002 is the election with Governor Barnes and, and, and Governor uh, Purdue. Um, Democrats have been wiped out statewide elections since 2010. Why haven't Demo Georgia Democrats been able to, to mount something of a political comeback to be, to be more competitive? Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure I can answer that. Sure. Uh, 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 and like I say, I'm not that terribly personally partisan myself. Uh, there's a lot of the Republican statewide candidates that I support and, and have supported. And uh, uh, I, you know, I, think, I think it has, you've got so much population up here in the suburban area that it's just about impossible for a person to run across uh, 
rural Georgia and rack up the votes right. uh, to, to do it. I mean, it's an urban versus rural thing, and you've got, what, 50 to 60 percent of the population in Georgia lives in suburban Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So uh, And going up every day. And going evening. up every day. So it's difficult. So th there are some political scientists and historians when they when they look at sort of the governing priorities, the the policy that gets passed and signed. That there's not much daylight between a Sonny Perdue and a Nathan Deal, both former Democrats, um, from from past Democratic governors George Busby, Joe Frank Harris. Um, where where do you fall? on that and the issue of governance and priorities between I don't Democrats. think there's a dime's worth of difference between either, any of them, if you want to know the truth. I mean, they're all solid, all four of them you mentioned are good, solid citizens, and uh, uh, no, there's not a nickel's worth of difference between them except the party label. You know, we're in a, you know, if we're setting aside Washington and the politics that goes on up there, it, you know, we're in a period of extreme partisanship. Um, are there issues that Democrats and Republicans in Georgia can can work on and have worked on? Oh, I think they are. I think they are. But now they've got to, economic development's probably primary. Everybody's divided on health care, Medicaid expansion, and mm -hmm. then on the education. There's a lot of discussion there uh, uh, between public private schools and that type of thing. So but uh, in things like economic development, thankfully what you're seeing today is that a lot of suburban Republicans and urban Republicans recognize the fact that uh, they've got to do something about rural Georgia in economic development. So I think that I think in economic development you do see that and finally we're seeing it in rural Georgia that people realize, you know, the engine that drives the economy of the state is Metro. And uh, you got, I don't mind telling them that, and Rotary Club talks, Kiwanis sure. talks, and all, all of my area. What do you think um, you know, the, the Republican Party, and I know this is another partisanship question, but the Republican Party has been solid control of the state since 2005 when they took, took the House. What do you think the biggest threat to Republican control of state of Georgia is is it is it an issue of changing demographics or or sort of disagreements within that party um, that might provide an opening to the to the Democratic opposition? I think the greatest problem they ha they face is the uh, uh, the uh, ideological differences within the Republican Party, and uh, I'm. Not going to be judgmental on that, but I I think uh, uh, I think if they continue to move too far out of the mainstream of the people of this state in their views to win in a Republican primary, it's going to be very difficult to come back to the center and represent all of Georgia. And uh, uh, it's not just uh, gun control or abortion or, or those type things, or, or vouchers for public schools or whatever, they need to focus in on the center, and that's what we saw with the Republicans in the 80s, the Johnny Isaacsons and Mike Egan's and Kill Townsend mm -hmm. and uh, Haskey Brantley's and people like that. They, uh, they, they were more or less the business Eisenhower Republicans, uh, but yet we've got all these people they, that it, within the Republican Party, if they step the least bit out of the extreme right, they call them liberals. And they're not liberals. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming... That's the greatest threat they face. Well, we're coming up on an election uh, in 2018. Um, both the governor and the lieutenant governor's seats are going to be open. Both are going to be open for the first time in a while um, because both, both Nathan Deal and Casey Cagle are, are, are moving on or moving up, as it were. Um, do you think that that's going to be a clarifying election, uh, or, or you know, on the Democratic side and the Republican side, you know, folks of different priorities? <coughs> I, I don't. At this point, and this we're is early, speaking, obviously. Yeah, it, we're a little early in that process, so I can't really answer that. But uh, uh, 
you know, that's not a issue I can sure, sure. nail down. Well, I guess just wrapping up or starting to wrap up, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at, you know, as somebody who, who's also very interested in, in, in history and preserving Georgia's history. What, what is it that you, you do with your, your time and your energies today now that you're no longer in the well, state Senate? I am, uh, I've served on the board of the Georgia Trust, the Humanities and the, uh, and the Georgia Historical Society, and all of their roles and vision for the state have been uh, of great interest to me. So it, it allows me to come to Atlanta and advocate for people that are nonprofits, that uh, need help, that never had anybody over at the Capitol except uh, volunteers, and uh, allows me to uh, be involved, because I'm a volunteer with them too, but I mean, they really knew what they were doing. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed it, and I serve on a lot of local committees down my way, and, and things like that. And so uh, uh, I'm not idle. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on, on behalf of the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia, I thank you for your service. Thank, thank you, you also as, a, as someone interested in the work of the Georgia Humanities Council. Um, really do appreciate it, and thank you very much for your time, Senator Hooks. Thank you.